the old news item machine. All right. Somebody had already pulled out some of them from one of the other machines, I think. Let's see. Life finds safety and duplication of services, hence collective thinking. Collective thinking is nothing but proof, while the individual variety is incapable of such. There are, amongst the civilized, those who continue to say that men think too much. <laughs> Everyone is automatically civilized once. Those who never go any further always suffer therefrom. Collective brain cells don't get old, they were born old. Since the entire intellectual world is of man's own making, what book need any person save a dictionary? Life will let you pay in advance for info that it never delivers. Imaginary problems have only imaginary solutions. Real problems have none. <laughs> The wars, this one, I'll go ahead and add a little, it's just put as a news item, but I think we should go ahead and turn it into something resembling a symbolic statement. The intellectual wars, it just says the wars, but the wars were eventually waged in the skies. And the collective for ammunition could only send up tracers. The obvious cannot be analyzed. For such an oleo, of staggering information, it's hard to know where to start. <laughs> Hence, not knowing, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Life finds safety and duplication of services, hence collective thinking. I assume everyone knows, or has as good an idea as I do about duplication of services, like backup. I know they've got terms now, and uh, well, backup programs, don't they, on computers. And But duplication of services originally was... Uh, I think the term came from the military, but it was always to have overkill. But it was actually a duplication of services because if you're out there and your life depended on, if we're talking about logistics, for instance, and we're sending out food to some battalion that's over there trapped or could be trapped behind enemy lines or somewhere equally distasteful. Then assuming that you're not just going to consider them disposable, a good army is going to duplicate the services. They're going to send over, duplicate, really. They'll send over two exact logistical units, the same amount of food, the same amount of protection, so that if one is wiped out, it's not, when they say duplication of services, it's not just simply a semi-backup. It's not that, all right, if the main uh, company that we send over gets wiped out, at least we got a few guys that will come, come around the other way. It's not a few guys, it is duplication of services. So that if the main unit they send out, if they figure the best way is to take Route X, and so they send that. True duplication of services is not to send out, let's say, 200 men with all X amount of supplies on Route X, and then send over 10 guys, and with some uh, coupons from Burger King over at Route Y. <laughs> Duplication of services meant literally that around Route Y they send exactly the same number of people, the same amount of supplies, the same amount of protection, the same amount of gunfire and cover as the first group. So that if, and the, they've got some choice, they have some preference, so we'll consider that the uh, general concluded that Route X would be preferable, you know, the most direct, whatever. But in case it does get wiped out, it's so that the Second, so that the alternative is no less than the original. So duplication of services was, was meant literally. That there is some importance to that because that is what makes this item refer to collective thinking. Because it's not the collective thinking that you have a man over here or even some group of men or an institution that has X amount of intelligence or information or savvy or wherewithal or recognized expertise in some area. And then down the street, across the town, on the other side of the world, is another group interested in the same affairs, apparently, but they only have, you know, <coughs> X over two. <clears throat> That's not the way life works. It duplicates. But the interesting thing is, with life, and duplicating these services and collective thinking, the duplication of services is not always 
running along the same polarized line because the duplication of services can be that you have group over here that are in support positively in a pro manner of a matter and the duplic duplication of services can be a group with a con <laughs> view of the same manner. <laughs> but it normally, what this is referring to, what I shouldn't have gone to the obvious <clears throat> so early. The services are actually duplicated, but they're not always that easy to see. With a the collective, they never see them. In fact, they would argue over it, they would dispute it. Because if literally, if you look at duplication of services, back to the example I made up of sending out supplies to uh, some battlefield troops, and you duplicate the absolute services on Route X to the troops, and then over here, Route Y, if you looked at that, then you could say, well, never mind the duplication of services, because it's two different things to start with. There's not actually duplicate because they're going in two different directions. They may try to get the same place and all that, but you cannot literally call that duplication of services. So if you try to talk about the way people think and you say, well, people, there's redundancy going on. As far as the built-in safeguard, as far as the power of collective thinking, is that when the collective decides something, ha ha. <laughs> well, I thought we'd have a little humorous break there. Okay, everybody back. Is when the collective thinks something, there's no danger of it breaking down. All right, once life makes a collective in some given area decide, so and so is true. There is power there. It is vigorous, vital, because some small little pissant attack on it. And I say pissant attack. Uh, that's French, by the way. That is not, that is not obscene. <laughs> All right. Pissant. <laughs> that if somebody comes along and attacks part of this information, that won't do away with it. A partial attack will never do because life is built in the safety factor of a continuing duplication of services. If it needs, uh, in the collective thinking of man, X amount of people, X amount of transforming agents, commonly known as humans, to believe a certain thing, and it was composed of a million people, I say, and something happened. A volcano erupts. There's a horrible bus crash and a half a million people are killed. I don't know. <laughs> that won't stop it. That won't stop it because you still got half a million to believe it. You understand? Life finds safety in duplication of services, hence collective thinking. There was a kind of a punchline to this. It says an individual is nobody's redundancy. I'm suspecting that this news item, whoever tapped it up on the wire and was thinking there's been several old songs that a lover is nobody's fool, a wise man is nobody's fool, all sorts of little things about a blank is nobody's fool. And I'm suspecting that whoever typed in this little parenthetical ending, an individual is nobody's redundancy. <coughs> Put it to you another way, although it's literally I won't say impossible this time. How about just literally real hard, real difficult, not to be redundant. But if you're being redundant, it's hard to say that you're being, intellectually speaking, an individual. The closest you can come to being redundant and still fall within something other than absolute collective is at least be plagiarizing yourself. But that is really iffy. I it's not to me to put a time on it for you, but all of you should feel this on your own by now. I mean, you can have a great thought, which is wonderful. But once you've had it, so what? <laughs> oh, yes, but I'd rather stop the bus and make my fortune off of this thought. <laughs> Many people do. Usually when somebody has what passes for a great thought, that's about the last one they ever have. And you find them years later, be they rich and famous or not. They're still, if they have not completely fallen into the grasp of the neural philistines within themselves, they are still stamping their foot, got some staff there with a tattered banner. They're still trying to get everyone's attention about this great thought I had back in 1947. Uh, as you all know, I didn't even have to do it. You all know what a great demand, respect, and fascination there is for an old person's ideas. 
See, that's the easy way to put it. Because the real way to put it is for a person's old ideas. But then there seems to be a kind of genetic, physical reality to this that makes it easier to see. That is, to tell somebody to make the statement the way I did. Uh, well, let's say, ask a 20-year-old person, how do you like hanging around your grandfather when he starts telling all these war stories from 40 years ago? And the kid may you know, not have anything particular against the old man, but he may say, you know, who wants to hear those old stories? You know, once it was sort of funny, maybe, interesting. But he tells them over and over. The real truth is, out at the herd, at the genetic level, the truth is nobody really enjoys old people's stories. But that's the cheap version. The real version, which you can't talk to people about because they would still want to change it. The real version is nobody likes to hear old stories. But it just seems easier to say no one likes to hear old people's stories. Because people nod to that and they go, you're right. Now who wants to hear that? But if you ask a 20-year-old, then to go back to that kind of example, and you ask a 20-year-old, uh, do you like your peer stories? And they'd probably say, well, some of them I do. Some of my friends have got good ideas and they're interesting to talk to, and some are not. So what? And you can't make people see, not in the collective sense, not at that level, that if you've heard a story once, you, you don't like to hear it at one level. If you're ordinary, you warned me not to start this, didn't you? If you're, or, if you're ordinary, though, you apparently do, which is, by the way, uh, the beginning of the top 40. It's the beginning of a station saying, here is your favorite song for the day, and you don't know whether it is or not, except they play it, and it's one you've been hearing all week, and you go, they're right, how'd they know? That's my favorite song. Of course, after a couple of weeks, it's not favorite. I lose everybody. By the way, there's a great one again if anybody needs it. An example. Uh, somebody pointed out it's going on, but it's just absolutely civilization, not just at speed. It's got to be warp speed, whatever that means. For all you science fiction, I always wanted to say that. <laughs> that is radio stations doing promos telling you about, well, Comparing themselves like we're not a whatever they're using. We're not a heavy metal station. We're not a child or we're not a teenage rap station. But I know some of you thought we were and you thought we were doing this and that. And they're encouraging you in the promo promising that regardless of what it is they're playing, you're going to like it even if you don't think you do. <laughs> I thought surely all of you were aware of that as much as me. It's regardless. Has, they're just ignoring the fact of whatever they're playing. The promos are telling you, you will love our station regardless of whether you like what we're playing or not. Because the promos are saying you are. That is civilization. That was, a, in a sense, a positive comment, in case any of you think that we've read news items that seem to be cheap shots at advertising. It's the same thing, in a sense. Advertising has got to be at that level, at an ordinary level of describing civilization and the intellectual world of man, it is probably uh, one of the more, if not the most, exemplary benchmark of civilization. And from one view, the more that you begin to take apart some specific example of advertising, well, the whole field of advertising, the point being that you see an ad for an automobile or whatever it is, and if you can hear it in a certain way, the advertisement may or may not have anything to do with the purpose of an automobile. In fact, the more civilized it is, the more chance it is of winning a Clio or some award, the less it will have to do. It'll be something kind of vague. It may apparently be almost poetic, or you think, well, this is going to have something to do with uh, you know, some metaphysical philosophy book, and it turns out that right then you see a car going over a hill. <laughs> And it flashes on the you know, screen, Toyota or a Honda. Uh, there's another way to look at it. To really get off the, we're not getting off the subject. You do understand that advertising, everybody knows this. Let's take automobiles and advertising agencies. Advertising agency, people sit in a room and they got nothing to do with automobiles. I just, it's so obvious, but I just want you to get the gist of it. It's guys sitting in a room in New York. 
as far away from where they manufacturing, if it was a Honda, as far away as they can get. In a sense, what they're doing is almost unrelated. The connection between what they're going to come up with almost makes tenuous sound bulletproof. It almost has, the only thing it has to do with the fact is that Honda's paying them to do it, and they get their check from Honda, and somewhere in the ad, Honda hopes, the name Honda will pop up. <laughs> but what they do, what they do almost has, I mean, it doesn't have to have anything to do. They'll be talking about, you know, love, romance, dreaming of the stars. So they'll be quoting Robert Frost. And you say, what the hell is this? And you could. I want you to follow the point. You could, from a reasonable, you could be a, an ordinary, reasonable, collective-based, smart-ass, intellectual, and say, you know, advertising, uh, I won't try to translate the French uh, version of this that many philosophically inclined people would say, but it comes out that advertising sucks. Because they would say, certain people would say that it, and it's worse than just saying it sucks. They would say it's almost obscene. They would almost say it's an intellectual affront. Because listen to what they're doing. They're trying to sell an automobile. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. No doubt about it. But listen to what they're doing. They're trying to appeal to my, some kind of poetic emotions. They're trying to make me have ideas that uh, I'm suddenly in some way drifting and dreaming. I suddenly find myself in Paris and I look around, there's this beautiful woman smiling at me, and I suddenly hear the strains of Stravinsky and the words of Racine or someone coming to my head, and suddenly go, buy a Honda. <laughs> and I think, you know, this has nothing to do, this is almost, I don't know what to say besides I've seen, if you don't get it, I'm not going to stay with it. And it's not. <coughs> it is almost the poster boy for civilization. <laughs> that they apparently are trying to do one thing, that first you hear it, and it seems to be some sort of, something to appeal to your poetic instincts, or they're going to talk about culture or art or whatever, and it turns out they're trying to sell a car, and you think, boy, how desperate. What a bunch of, you know, they must be, if they're not on drugs, those people must be drinking, you know, like a full strength cup of coffee every five minutes. You know, they've got to be wired up like this. How in the world could a group of people come up and think this has anything to do with an automobile? It doesn't have to have anything to do with an automobile. You missed it. Well, in case you didn't miss it, how about this? Turn right on your television or radio or pick out different magazines if you don't follow this right quick and pick out those that would appear, that would appeal to a less civilized, to a less sophisticated audience, and they don't fool around. That is, if it's a low-class beer, which don't anybody bring up the word oxymoronical, <laughs> if, it, if, it's a, a, if it's truly a cheap beer or mad dog wine or something, they don't fool around. They're not showing Paris and all that. They're going to show a guy in Levi's and a cowboy hat staying at a bar trying to pinch some girl in the ass and they got a bottle of you know, red dog wine here, mad dog wine, and they're saying, you know, get drunk and be somebody, cheap. And they don't fool around. That would be the advertising. They paid their brother-in-law $10 to come up with that. But the point is, the more civilized it becomes, if it becomes champagne, if it becomes expensive wine, which we got to take oxymoronical somewhere else. Like, you know, you're trying to get drunk, but yes, I want to do it in a very, very costly way. That, that, that'll make me feel better. All right, instead of you know, mad dog wine at a dollar a pint or whatever it is, if you start getting into you know, champagne, something that's $50 a bottle, what are they going to do? You're not going to see some guy staying at a bar, you know, trying to put the make on some woman that's saying something like, you know, get drunk and be somebody and pretend that you're a high class. Uh-uh. <laughs> then you start getting into the area. You'll see a man standing and perhaps a shadow of a woman outside the French doors in this mansion and him saying something. This reminds me of St. Tropez, 1989. And the man's looking off of this bottle with this glass, a sniffer of brandy or a glass of champagne. And it looks like, what does that have to do with you know, drinking booze? 
but the more sophisticated you are, the further it begins to stretch from what people in advertising are talking about and what the product seems to be. Now, at least anybody think I'm talking about advertising, would anybody like to think up such, uh, suddenly consider such ever popular areas that do not even have to put liquid in your mouth necessarily, such as religion? <laughs> Almost no connection between the advertising and the product or the service. <laughs> The further, once you're talking about man's intellectual world that we've already mentioned several times that you're into an area that literally speaking, you could live without. Just literally. You wouldn't want to and it would not be life as we know it and it would not be life as it should be lived. But you could get by with everything, get by without everything except just the basic requirements of food and you know, sleep and collectively speaking, of course, sex and keep the race going and all that. But the more civilized you are, the more you must be interested in the non-essential, literally speaking. And the more that you're interested in the non-essential, the more they have to be pushed, the more they have to, that they do have to be advertised. And in case you'd like to see something else that's a little interesting, is right now we have, that's not that far removed from our sort of culture and intellectual wiring, is uh, Eastern Europe. Suddenly, out from under tyranny in the last couple of years, and they're trying to do as they call it, the free market, trying to go from planned economy, and they've had no advertising over there, the state advertised, you know, buy a, buy a Russian mobile or we'll kill you. And everybody thought, well, if I could afford a car, <laughs> by God, I'd, I'd buy one, you know, a Kremlin mobile. That, that's the form of their advertising, you know. You know so buy what the state's put out or die. And everybody, you know, well, if I had any money, that's sure what I'd buy, as if they had a choice. But what I was going to point out, now that just almost overnight, they had the right to, to enter into free markets, and they opened it up and began to privatize, you know, the, what the state owned and sell off all the stuff, and then people tried to advertise. They are having a hell of a time because they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> that is, even those who can afford it, they, they now have the non-essentials available, and they're not sure what to do. You know, like, well, we've been so long just, you know, I've been having to eat sweet potatoes, you know, for the last 20 years. And now they say, well, you could have something else. And you think, they seem to think, well, I'm not sure I want it. I, I'm not sure I trust this. <laughs> I got a few extra copals now. I think I'll just buy more potatoes. And they're trying to tell them, no, no, I'll buy something else. And people think, no, nah, I think I'll just hoard some potatoes. And they try to tell them, no, nah. <laughs> you know, now you could afford something. You could afford luxuries. And people think, what luxuries? I just barely got enough potatoes. And they said, no, nah, I'll buy a TV. <laughs> And so maybe somebody decides, well, maybe I will buy a TV. But then the free market tries to take over. And so they say, well, buy a, you know, Kelv TV. And so the guy thinks, maybe I will. And then somebody says, no, nah, wait a minute. Buy a Moscow TV. Buy a Perm TV. I'm just naming Russian cities. In other words, they're competing brands, let's say. And it gets past one brand. Like it's enough to get a guy away from don't keep buying potatoes and stuffing them in your mattress. You're not going to starve anymore. <laughs> Buy a TV. Maybe the guy says, all right, maybe I will. But as soon as he, now he's into the non-essentials. And as soon as he gets into the non-essentials, he just barely decided, all right, I will. Buy something other than a potato. I'll buy a TV or a little portable radio. But then you got advertising jumps in and says, wait a minute. Don't buy just any radio. Don't buy Radio X. Buy Radio X. X plus, and they're almost now going into some kind of brain gridlock. That you know, it's bad enough that you're trying to get me to involve myself in being interested in the non-essentials. We're inexperienced enough with that, but then to try and muddy it up and give me a choice. <laughs> well, you can take it that we're still talking about, it and I'm not giving you even an attempted lesson in current events is tied to what I'm talking about. It's just as life collectively expands, the more and more, not only do you have to be interested just to stay sane, to keep, get and keep going if you're ordinary, to be interested in the non-essentials, but then you have to get interested because there's only so many non but it seems like there's only so many non-essentials at any one time. They keep coming up with new ones, you know. After, uh, you know, records have gone far enough, violent became CD, and it became, you know, we're going to have a recordable CD now soon, we got, digital tape, and they keep coming up with little variations of it. But then they had to keep pushing one brand over another. And it's hard to push, in a sense, it's hard to push a non-essential 
over another non-essential. <laughs> and so once you're dealing with that is why advertising, as I said, the more it seems unconnected to the service or the good, if it's secondary, the more the sense that it is running right at warp speed of being civilized, that it is the avant-garde, the more that from one view you could say, this is ridiculous, this is absolutely insane that they're trying to sell an automobile and bastardizing, balderizing, <laughs> stealing from the world's great poets and thinkers and trying to flash up you know, some quote from Plato and show people looking very intellectual and this and that, and they're trying to sell a damn car a pickup truck. Who the hell they think I am? Well, they know who you are because you're them and they're you and etc. They just get paid for it. It has to become less and less, in a sense, connected to even any appearance of there being a direct correlation between the advertising copy and what the goods or services are. One other time, it's not just advertising or religion since I pull it out. Just look up here. What makes you keep thinking at the ordinary level? When you're thinking about things that are irrelevant. That is, you think about things that are not necessary, they're not survival thoughts. It's not things that you think about all the time that you have to think about just to live. Because if you're just ordinary and sane, all you know is you've got to get up and go to work, and they'll, you know, at the end of the week they give you a check, and you go to the grocery store, and you buy food. You're saying your utility bill, and you're saying your mortgage, and you've got a place to live. You know, big deal. You can run on automatic pilot. You don't even have to think about it. So what is it you do think about? You think about, look in the guide and see what's on at the movies. Let's find something to do. I'm going nuts. I work all week. Find something. Turn on the TV. Where's the TV guide? What do you mean there? A subscription ran out. People think more and more about that, which is not absolutely necessary for survival, as they must. I don't know whether they should go in the middle of what we're talking about or not, but we're in the middle of what we're talking about, so here it goes. The existence of the physical universe and the movements of the heavenly bodies were originally taken by men to be metaphors to their own minds. That is, until one guy realized, hey, that star over there is actually bigger than my own brain. That's for all of you people who have been holding grudges against metaphors. Run with it. <laughs> Collective thinking is nothing but proof, while the individual variety is incapable of same. What is ordinarily referred to as collective, or what we've been referring to as collective thinking, remember, is always a response. It's connected to what we were talking about once, about the dense, the ordinary, are never stuck for an answer. Now, I think the first news item we read a few days ago just started out crudely, as some of them seem to do, that said the stupid have all the answers. Not just the stupid out there, the stupid in you. They had all the answers. Oh, and if you want to clean it up and get a bit more apparently sophisticated, is that ordinary minds are never stuck for an answer. Because if they are, they are beginning now to disintegrate. They're becoming their own form of Yugoslavia. They're becoming unstable. An ordinary mind is not stuck for an answer. The kind of examples we already made them up plenty of times that sometimes at the very least, or at the very worst, from ordinary views, I mean, a smart of it could call them rationalizations and excuses, but they're not. They're answers. Is to try to catch a mind, ask somebody a question. What do you mean you don't know the answer to that? I thought you were major than that. Uh, and a man will say something. Well, I've been sick. Oh, oh, I, oh, 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 that. Oh, oh. Well, I, geez, I didn't hear that music. Was I didn't hear what you said. That's after the guy said, wait a minute. The answer to why he's asking you so-and-so. He already answered it or corrected you. And he says, I thought you knew stuff like that. An ordinary sane person caught flat-footed, just dumbass as hell, is not actually caught flat-footed and is not going to appear to be dumbass as hell. If he does, it is a transient systemic anomaly. It will pass shortly, he'll look off, and then law forget about it because the ordinary mind cannot be stuck for an answer. On that basis, to bring, that brings us up to date, doesn't it? On that basis, back to this news item, that collective thinking is nothing but proof, while the individual variety is incapable of saying. Generally speaking, of course, they're casual chit-chat and people talking about football, baseball, and politics, and et cetera. But speaking in general, collective thinking, on the level that it has some importance and some significance, it is nothing but proof. That is, the more significant it seems to be. And we're not questioning it, it just appears to be significant to people then the more it is, nothing but proof. That is the only reason that people are talking. 
is they're trying to prove something. And ordinarily, they do prove something in the widest sense. They may say, well, here's my opinion on something. But they're actually trying to prove something. And if it's a conversation going on, and another person may say, well, I disagree with you. Some guy makes some comment about, well, I'm going to tell you, since the Communist Party has almost collapsed in Italy, and there, there's nobody on the horizon, no party is ever going to come up with a, a parliamentary majority. I'm going to tell you, they are about one step away from balkanizing that peninsula right there. And a man saying something, you can say, well, that's just chit-chat at a cocktail party. And another guy over here, in the same kind of collective dance, he listened to the guy and he says, uh, well, when you start talking about the so-called balkanization of breaking up a previous countries such as Yugoslavia, which was already forcefully held together of different ethnic mix mixes that had a history of conflict and were just held together under the tyrannical rule of that late great hero, Marshal Tito. We have no such similar situation in Italy, so I cannot agree that what you said is correct. They were both speaking. It has no significance. I just wanted you to see it can get complicated and sound like that somebody is extreme opinion or one of them could be learned. I could throw in all sorts of things. But the point is, collective thinking in both cases was nothing but proof. People were not saying, well, it's my turn to talk. And they're all staying around having cocktails. And they all go, yeah. And the man goes, well, Jesus. I mean, I'm such a bubble brain, I got no idea what to say. But here goes, take it tongue, take it lips. You know, let's do something about, oh, I don't know, uh, Italy. And you know, go, go with it. And the man waits to see what his lips, nah. Of course, we're not saying that there's no validity to that description, but that, <laughs> that is not what's going on. I assume that's sufficient to understand that in that sense, collective thinking is nothing but proof. Now, it can be somebody's opinion. You could certainly jump into my example and say, well, that's, no, that's not proof. One guy's saying, well, since the Communist Party or some other central or majority party is now crumbling, that Italy will never be able to put together another strong government. You can say, well, that's, you know, it may or might be true, but that's not proof. Sure it is. The guy said it. You got to understand what proof is. The guy didn't say. That's why I made the silly part of the example. The guy didn't say, well, let's see. You want me to talk about, it's my turn, right? And they'll go, yeah, we're trying to take a break. All right, now what you want me, why don't you talk about Italy? Oh, all right, I don't know a damn thing about it. Of course, I don't know much about anything, but here goes. <laughs> all right, a one, a two, take it lips. And his lips, they're going to start talking about. I just want you to understand. See, you, what he was saying compared to that is proof. That's the whole point of collective thinking. And it doesn't, it does not become dogmatic, infinite proof because it's always changing. But as it changes, as it seems to progress, collective thinking, as it seems to progress, thus on the basis that they seem to go from one area that something was proven. It was generally accepted as being true by the collective. Now, it will change, and they'll finally see more. They'll finally expand their vision of it. The circumstances will change. They'll have to revise their description. Whatever it is, it will change. But then it's like change, like, well, you know, last week, that was a fact. To the best of our knowledge, it was proof. But you're right, circumstances have changed. And so collectively, we have changed. But it's always a matter of proof that that's what it's based on. This attempting. I left out the news I'm left out attempting, which is irrelevant once you understand it. Collective thinking is nothing but proof. If it's not something presented within the context of proof, it's just Bible. It may be all right, it's just social conversation, but it is not at the heart, it is not the muscles and sinews that hold together collective thinking. Collective thinking at its heart is a matter of proof, comma, while the individual variety is incapable of such. That is, if you can think, it's got nothing to do with proof. If you can think outside the collective, how would it have anything to do with proof? Because if it starts having anything to do with proof, you're back in the collective because the only thing you're going to think that is proof is, wait a minute, I'm right and they're wrong. Then you're like a wart on some Poor cow that's just over at the edge of the herd, maybe about to fall out. Because as soon as you compare it, as soon as you say, uh, as soon as you're op operating on the base, even if you were close to having some kind of original thought, as long as it becomes in some way comparable to what everyone else is thinking, then it becomes a matter of proof to you that, uh-huh, 
And as soon as you start that kind of crap, believe me, you're just one step away from proof. As hey, you're one step to being back with them. Oh, no, I'm not because I see through them. Individual thinking has nothing to do with proof, which is why it is so popular to discuss. It's so easy to talk about. <laughs> it's why everyone is just absolutely, I mean, what could be more popular? Everyone's wanting it. They just, there are much the civilized, those who say that men can think too much. There are amongst the civilized, though, who say that men can think too much. I just wanted to read it again. Almost every, I don't know, 50 or 60 years throughout history in the West, somebody, quote, famous has said that. They'll change it a little bit, and somebody will write it down and reprint it somewhere. Psychologists, philosophers, religious people. It's possible that a man can think too much. Some people even have a grandmother. Or an ad that says, you know what? And they'll look right at you. Just <laughs> using you generically. Just after you got through going off on some wild philosophical, you know, something that you're responding to a TV show or something that people sitting around there in your grandmother's parlor talking about. And one of your relatives in a nice way looks kind of at you and just says in general, you know it's possible for a person to probably think too much. A word to the wise, yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this other item was somewhat, I think, tied to it. Everyone is automatically civilized once, which we've been through, and those who never go any further always suffer therefrom, which is, figuratively or casually speaking, which seems sort of interesting, since if you didn't become civilized, you would really suffer. In fact, the less you're civilized today, relatively speaking, you are in a less comfortable position, not just financially, but it probably would reflect itself in that. Socially, certainly. And so you, if you're not civilized, or the less you are civilized, the less comfortable you're going to be in life, financially in other ways probably, but just especially being alive. But this says everyone is automatically civilized once, and those who never go any further always suffer therefrom. You know, as you have been given how about the great poison apple or that delicious Bismarck that rather than being filled with sweets was filled with something a bit less savory, which I won't say the word from that last news item last time. Did you get civilized? Whether you remembered or not, it was the moment of great joy when you finally spoke and your parents got over that initial shock and running around. And you became a person, and you were civilized. But that, you notice, I was suggesting was tied to that previous one, that there are those who say that men can think too much. That is the kind of suffering when somebody gets civilized once. Somebody learns how to talk one time. They learn how to think one time. They think. And if that's all they do, then they are subject to say, or they're subject to not along when somebody says, you know, it's possible to think too much. You know, just drive yourself nuts, drive yourself crazy. Run your emotions and your feelings, your human relationships. Just run them absolutely ragged. You know, a person, some things you shouldn't think about. And quite civilized people will go, you're right. Which, and don't ever open the hood and look under there and think, <laughs> wait a minute, what? But this is why I was suggesting there could be some connection. Everyone is automatically civilized once, but those who never go any further always suffer therefrom. That is, you end up suffering in a sense. This is irrelevant to ordinary people, the collective, but you can end up suffering over that, which was the singular joy, the one thing, since I know you won't take it personally, that actually distinguishes you from a mink <laughs> or a rhino. <laughs> The very thing then becomes, how come I can't be as happy as a hippo? <laughs> and your mother, your grandmother goes, well, I don't know, but, you know, it's possible to probably think too much. <laughs> Which is a way to say it's, it's possible to be too civilized. But then if you tried to tell them, I'm going to have to hurry this, then they would want to change and say, wait a minute, you mean it's possible to not be 
sufficiently civilized. Yeah, the same thing. That too. Of course, then, even though they're your relatives, they would probably ask that you leave the house. Well, nobody likes a nut. Practical info for the individual was the heading of this news item. Collective brain cells don't get old, they were born old. They were born civilized. As soon as the brain can speak, it's old. You don't have to worry about the, the cortical neurons getting old. If you want to really stretch it, I know what people can say they do. And they can say, well, I was a bit more broad-minded. I had wider interest in life when I was seven or eight because at that time I didn't know whether I wanted to be a baseball player, a shortstop for the White Sox, or whether I wanted to be a cowboy. <laughs> and so it seemed like, you know, in life, there were more choices available. And now I'm 20, you know, what is it you want? Well, probably like to die, but it scares me. <laughs> but, I'd like to have an unlimited supply of drugs. And then they could say, you see, I used to have a more pliable mind. Well, if you won't say that. But the truth is, the day after you could speak, it was about all over, intellectually. You don't have to worry about the brain if you're operating at the ordinary level. You don't have to worry about, is my brain getting old? Yes. But it's too late to worry about that. That brain, it's like, well, have I been too civilized? Yes. Has my degree of civilization personally become stale? Well, it's nice you should ask. I mean, you're about 35 years too late or 20 years too late, but yes. And you know it. Where some people do it, they wouldn't even ask. Everybody else says, wait a minute, there's something wrong with the garden. There's something about, there's something wrong without being, being out here in the fields, in the wilds, where is the new promised land? And they think it's out there. I got to find somewhere new. And what there, you got to have, if there was any validity to the ordinary view, what you got to have is a new promised land of brain cells. What you got to do is not find the land of milk and honey. You don't have to get away from Pharaoh and Egypt. You got to get away from the old brain cells. You got to get away from the first stage of civilization. Nah, uh, too mythical. Yeah, I know. Too metaphorical, probably. Except remember this, you don't have to look at a star. Even the whole North Africa is larger than your brain. Jesus, I never thought about that. Probably just downtown Cairo is larger than your brain. Well, it's good to be able to take symbolism and you know get it down to some manageable shape. All right, do you mean the actual city limits of Cairo or the, you know, the greater, the greater Cairoian era, area? Which is larger than my brain? Or you could ask, which is older than my brain? Collective brain cells don't get old, they were born old. Another way to put that, at least it sounds like just some sort of attack, is that as part of the stability of collective thinking. Is it like you were born, you and everyone else, everybody born into the collective, it's like you were born and you're already mature. Does that sound better than old? You're already an old stogie, an old fogey. You're already a stick in the mud. What would you say nowadays? You're already outdated. You're already a 47 Pontiac. Nah, a 52 DeSoto. They don't make those anymore. Now we're getting closer. That is where you're born in the collective. And if you want to see it a little bit more wide-eyed, it's like you're born in the collective and for a few seconds, for a short period of time. Everybody who's born in the collective is not old, that you are a danger, you're a threat. That's why they put diapers on you and tell you, hush! <laughs> or that's why you can't talk better, that's why you can't get walk around because you could do great damage. Having a mind that young, you just don't have the vocabulary, but if you could actually get out when you were two years old and drive a car or get inside a university, fall into some kind of debate with the great thinkers of the world, you would do severe damage. Not that you know more, but you would have those people climbing the walls, which babies almost make people climb the walls anyway, they just don't know why. 
when they just say things, y'all. Which way is up? I told you that way. Yeah, but why? Jesus, will you leave me alone? So you're, you are born nine old, if you want that. But it is a severely limited childhood. And it can literally be no more than a matter of hours, days, it doesn't matter. But you are born already just a few, a few days, a few weeks, away from being middle-aged at the very least. By the time you get to be 11, 12, 13 years old nowadays, you're middle-aged. You should know. Try and grab somebody that age nowadays and say, it would be to your benefit or it could be interesting if I could really change or expand even, not just change them uh, out of hand, but to expand, to stretch your taste in music, clothes, whatever it is you're interested in life. And a teenager, or at least you know, 21, we used to be the time, but nowadays a teenager, they would say, hey, I'll pass. You know, I know what I like. I don't, I don't need that. So you are nine old for a short period of time. But understand, it is not something that's amiss. It helps create stability because you could not have suddenly, if we had you know, four billion grown people on this planet and every day there was like another one billion kids born, that is non-old intellectually, non-mature intellectually, and they stayed that way for some period of time, it is disruptive. It is like that great machine that's paving everything, laying down the asphalt. And it's like every now and then, you know, maybe the thing's still turning and nothing coming out. And you'll certainly start having untoward holes in the road. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the brain getting old. It's born. I assume you got by now. I don't, so we don't have to say it's born old. It is born with an irresistible, immediate inclination to almost as soon as possible to get old. Whew, now I'm, I'm mature, I'm educated, I got two or three kids, I'm married, I got a mortgage. Thank God, now I don't have to think. <laughs> what time's the bar is open? When are they gonna have a sale on cocaine and crack? You no longer have to think, well, do I still wanna play for the, you know, do, do I really wanna play for the White Sox? Does it mean that much to me? And here's a guy 22 nowadays or 25, it's, you know, he's 50 pounds overweight and he's working two jobs. It's ridiculous. There's no longer any great matter of choices. The only choice is, am I going to kill myself or go to work again? <laughs> Life will let you pay in advance for info it never delivers. That is tied in to this. It's when you're young, when you're not old yet, in that little small window that you, we could say the collective have to think. It's as old life promises. It's as old life, if you want to, those of you that enjoy myths still, it's as though everyone's born, you're suddenly part of the wandering tribe of Judea, and you look up there and it's like there's always a Moses saying, come on. Just a little bit further and everything will be all right. You know, just follow me. And so it's like, it's like Moses saying, you could play for the White Sox. You could be a famous musician. You could write poetry. You go, yes, I could. Yes, I could. And so it promises. And it lets you pay in advance. That is, you believe it. And then what happens? Oh, do I have to carry the mess any further? Or at least my retelling of it? Pretty soon you find out, Jesus, I'm going in circles, or we're going nowhere. And you can't ever get your hands on Moses, though. He's always way up ahead. He's even further now than he was when he first talked to you. When you first had the dreams of what you might do, now it's even further away. Uh, there is a bit of, may I suggest, sardonic humor in this news item to say life will let you pay in advance for info it never delivers. <laughs> you know, let you is kind of a joke. <laughs> Because if you're a saint, it doesn't let you. It demands payment. It's like as soon as you learn how to talk, you get this COD bill in the mail. <laughs> in fact, there's a racket going on. If you people hadn't heard about it, it's, it's one of these delicious ones. That uh, there's guys around companies, you know, con men, and they're sending out. They'll print up. They got envelopes, and, you know, bills and all. And it says whatever it is. 
ABC office supplies. And they're just going to a city and they'll go down the phone book and almost any kind of business that might use office supplies, they just send them a bill. You know, a regular, you know, envelope that with their name just, you know, to the, to the Jones accounting firm and they just send it list, you know, t 20 reams of paper, whatever they, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, please remit $275, 2% discount if you put, and it's surprising, they say, the number of people that just comes in their office and they say a bill and it's got their name on it, it's for the kind of stuff they use and they just write them a check. You follow. That is exactly, they stole that from life, like everything else. <laughs> but, you know, really, I mean, it's bad enough for everybody else, but really expect crooks to give life credit. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that, that's the joke that life sends you a bill as soon as you can talk. As soon as you talk and you're kind of staggering around, it's like suddenly a postman jumps in and says, for you, and you're just a little nipper. And you think it's my first, my first letter. <laughs> what you don't understand is that first letter is a bill. Life bills you in advance, and you have, you have to pay it, or you couldn't keep talking. If you don't pay it, if you want to look at another way to carry this further, which this is not what caused it, but if you didn't pay it, if in some way you willfully couldn't, your brain would collapse. You would become disabled up here. I mean, truly. So you got no choice. This life sends you the bill. It's like, all right, you got a few seconds now. It's like a contest almost. Are you going to play or not? Do you want to go on to the next stage? Do you want to be alive intellectually, or would you like to become sort of like a kumquat with legs and arms? And you go, well, I, Monty, I think I'll play on for the next, you know, I, I think I'll play for the next day. <laughs> Life bills you in advance for info, for goods and services that it never delivers. It's Moses saying, who wants to go with me out of this joint? And everybody goes, well, I do. And he says, well, come on. And that's it. And then it's 30 years later and you realize, you know, I had moved, you know, maybe uh, two or three feet away from where I was when it started. Well, that's right, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> it's the nature, it's the nature of the collective is life will let you pay in advance for info it never delivers. It can't collectively. It would be self-defeating. Individually speaking, could be <clears throat> another matter. Imaginary problems only have imaginary solutions, Dice. Real problems have none. I was hoping I'd find something to leave on a positive note. That <laughs> that is truly, truly. But notice again, it's tied in the collective. Imaginary problems have only imaginary solutions. That is like somebody trying to lead a uh, group of lost souls from the promised land. Are you getting a bill that's also a promise that says pay this and you'll be even better shape? It's all religions. It's all philosophy. It's all common sense. It's every cliche. It's every truism, maxim, proverb, aphorism in the world is a promise. It's, it's a solution. It's a cure. To a what? Well, to some problem that humanity has, some serious question, something that plagues men's soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an imaginary problem. They're all imaginary solutions. But the great thing is, is once you understand that, you know, you can get over all, then all these other things, they're imaginary solutions, but it's fine because they're imaginary solutions to imaginary problems. And so once you get that down, then you can go into something positive. <laughs> then you realize that, on that, that once you see that, then you understand, well, real problems have none. Do you understand? Then there's nothing to worry about. Imaginary problems only have imaginary solutions. And once you get that, you got to see it. You can't be told it. You got to see. Everything having to do with man's intellectual world is in that sense imaginary. And so whatever problem there is, like, well, I'm ugly, you know, which may or may not be physically true if we were speaking at a non-verbal level. Or you could say, well, I am not pretty enough. How about that? I do not look my looks, genetically, for some reason, I just do not have the look of an upper-class person. I do not look like royalty. <laughs> I just look. I can look. I look like that I'm the offshoot of a bricklayer and a cocktail waitress. No offense to <laughs> a bricklayer and a pickup truck. How about that? At any rate, or I hate my social position. I'll never get anywhere in life if I can't get away from my background, from this neighborhood, from... Once you understand, uh, it's irrelevant. 
to some people, once you understand where it is you're itching individually, if you ever do, collectively, that's where everybody thinks they itch, somewhere like that. But once you understand that there is no cure for it, because it's not a problem. It's not a problem in the sense that there are such things as real problems. What well, would you give us an example? How about death? <laughs> Most people couldn't say they're a problem. All right, here's the great thing about it. There is no cure. No. If that seemed too dramatic or too abrupt, how about fatal illness? Let's try that. <laughs> not just death, because that just sounds like you're, you know. All right, fatal illness. Fatal illness, you go to a doctor, you know, and he says, uh, Oh, you're ugly. And you say, well, I didn't come for that kind of opinion. <laughs> he says, oh, all right, take off your clothes. And he says, hey, you're uglier than I thought. <laughs> now, then he says, then he does what you came there for. He says, uh, by the way, I've checked you over, and you're not as ugly as I've seen people uglier. But uh, there is one thing. Oh, yeah, I wanted to mention, you're going to die in six months. Nothing we can do, absolutely going to die. All right, you call out a problem compared to, uh, I don't have any of this year's fashions. I don't have anything from the spring collection from Paris. <laughs> All right, compared to that, if the guy says you're going to die in six months and he brings in associates from down the hall or people are not even associated with his clinic, but other, they all say, there's no doubt you'll be dead in six months if you call it a real problem. Here's the thing about it. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> because real problems have no solutions. So you understand, once you understand this full, the full ramifications of this, in a sense, you can slide home free even if you're not playing for the white side. Imaginary problems only have imaginary solutions, which that takes care of that, Daesh. Real problems have none. Hey, that is a route.